When Washington Crossed the Delaware, a wintertime story for young patriots, written by Lynn Cheney, paintings by Peter M. Fior. I remember reading in my youth a small book, The Life of Washington, and all of his struggles none fixed itself on my mind so indelibly as the crossing of the Delaware preceding the Battle of Trenton. I am exceedingly anxious that the object they fought for, liberty and the union and constitution they formed, shall all be perpetual. It was November 1776, a time of trouble for our young country. We were fighting for our independence from Britain, and the war was not going well. The British had defeated General George Washington and his men on Long Island, had driven them out of New York, and were pursuing them across New Jersey. George Washington was discouraged. How could the Americans, who were mostly new to fighting, ever hope to defeat the well-trained Redcoats? This night we lay amongst the leaves without tents or blankets. The Americans retreated through cold and rain. Many had no jackets to keep them warm. Many had no shoes and marched with rags wrapped around their feet. Everyone was hungry. In early December, the Americans made it across the Delaware River into Pennsylvania under General Washington's orders. They had taken every boat so they could find with them. They, so they knew they were safe from the British for a while, but they were sick, exhausted, and cold. No one the struggle seemed hopeless. George Washington did not give up. On the other side of the river, the British had stationed Hessians, German soldiers the British had hired to fight for them. The Hessians didn't have much respect for American soldiers. They didn't think the Americans would dare to do anything bold or daring. So George Washington decided on, bold, on a bold and daring course. He called a meeting of his generals and worked out a plan. On Christmas night, American troops would cross the Delaware River in several places. Before dawn on December 26, they would attack the Hessians at Trenton, New Jersey. Washington warned his officers to keep the plan a secret. He could only succeed if he believed. If the Americans caught the Hessians by surprise, Christmas Day and night is a time fixed upon our attempt in Trenton. Let them call me rebel by Thomas Paine. Also crucial to success was the spirit of the American troops, beaten down as they were. Could they fight another battle? A man named Thomas Paine had marched without the Americans as they retreated across New Jersey. Now he came up with the words to encourage them. These are, these are the times they try men's souls, he wrote. And the summer soldier and the sunshine patriot will, in this crisis, shrink from the service of their country. But it stands now, he deserves the love and thank of man and woman. In camps along the Delaware, George Washington's re men read Payne's words and drew strength from them for the battle ahead. This is night 1776. General Washington led 2,400 men, the main body of his army, to a crossing point about nine miles upstream from Trenton. There, the soldiers crowded into the large black boats that would take them to the opposite shore. The night was cold, and the men had faced a difficult crossing. They had to break through ice to get the boats into the river. They had to fend off large chunks of ice once they were on their way. But Washington had seafarers with him. That night, he knew how to navigate treacherous waters. The sailors of Massachusetts' Marblehead Battle Lion maneuvered boat after boat across the icy river. As soon as they got one group of men to the New Jersey shore, they returned to pick up another. The force of the current and the sharpness of the frost, the 
ice which made during the operation rendered the passage of the river extremely difficult. Washington arrived on the New Jersey side of the Delaware in the early hours of the crossing. Wrapped in his cloak, he watched his cold, wet soldiers make their way onto the land. Their spirits were good, but he was worried. The crossing was taking longer than he had planned. Washington's army had 18 cannon, and getting them across the river was especially hard. A gun with its carriage and ammunition could weigh 2,000 pounds, and loading it on and off a slippery ferry was slow and dangerous work. Downstream, two of Washington's commanders also struggled to get men and guns across the river. In the end, neither General James Ewing or Colonial John Cadwalder could get through on the ice to the Delaware. They had to give up on the idea of fighting at Trenton. But at 3 o'clock in the morning, George Washington's crossing succeeded. The last gun was on shore, and the general and his men prepared for the nine-mile march to Trenton. Perseverance accomplished what at first seemed impossible. Remember now what you are about to fight for. It was 4 o'clock in the morning before the army was ready to move up, hours later than Washington had planned. He was hoping to attack the Hessians, but it was still dark, but now the sun would be up before Americans reached Trenton. Would an attack in daylight still be a surprise? But there was no turning back. Through cold and sleet, the American troops moved along icy roads toward Trenton. Washington and his officers rode alongside the men, encouraging them onward. When the Americans encountered the first Hessians, it was clear that the surprise had worked. The startled Hessians retreated. The Americans pressed forward with such determination that the Hessians had little time to organize a defense. When the American artillery began to bombard them, the German soldiers had no choice but to abandon the streets of Trenton and withdraw an orchard nearby. Nineteen-year-old Captain Alexander Hamilton led one of the companies firing on the Hessians. He would later sign the U.S. Constitution and help ensure that the states accepted it. He would become our country's first Secretary of the Treasury. Another soldier fighting that day was 18-year-old Lieutenant James Monroe. But the Hessians managed to get two of their cannon into operation. Monroe was one of the first officers who charged the guns. He was badly wounded, and he would live to become our nation's fifth president. Then in the great drum came the beating of the drums and the sound of the firing. This is a glorious day for our country. The Hessians tried an attack of their own. With drums beating, they marched from the orchard toward the center of town. But the Americans were strong. In the fight that followed, the Hessians commander, Colonel Joan Rawl, was mortally wounded and many of his men were killed. The rest of the Hessians retreated, but the Americans soon had them surrounded. Two German regiments decided it was time to quit fighting and they lowered their flags to the ground. Then the third and last regiment surrendered. Two hours from the time it had started, the Battle of Trenton was over. With few losses of their own, the Americans had captured nearly 900 Hessians. After many defeats, they had won a great victory. Most of Washington's men had the right to go home at the end of the year, but Washington needed them to stay. Persuading them to keep fighting would be hard, he knew. He could see how tired they were as they transported their Hessian prisoners across the Delaware to Pennsylvania. He could see that they were cold. Many marched without shoes and left bloody footprints in the snow. Once his men were back in New Jersey, Washington promised extra pay to those who would serve longer, and he appealed to their love for their country. This was an hour of destiny, he told one regiment, a time that would decide America's fate. If they wanted their country to be free, they had to keep fighting. Drums rolled, a few of the men stepped forward, and then more and more. Many of Washington's battle-tested soldiers resolved to stay at his side. We know not how to spare you. There were thousands of British and Hessian troops gathering at Princeton, New Jersey, a pretty college town northeast of Trenton. Certain that they would soon attack, Washington sent out a call for more forces. Veteran fighters joined him, as he did many men who had never fought before. Washington ordered most of his troops to line up along a ridge on the south side of a Sun Pink Creek. He also sent a force to the north side of the creek where the British and Hessians were advancing. Washington ordered these men to slow the enemy down. Near evening on January 2, 1777, the troops sent to delay the British had done all they could. 
They ran for a narrow bridge that would take them back to the uh, a sun pink. As they crowded onto it, they saw General Washington at the far end. The enemy was right behind them, but the sight of their commander, firm and steady, gave them courage. I pressed it against the shoulder of the general's horse and in contact with the boots of the general. The horse stood firm as the rider. Got the old fox safe now. We'll go over and beg him in the morning. General Charles Cornwallis, the British commander, thought he had Washington trapped. He thought he could wait until morning to attack the Americans. But Washington had other plans. He knew that Cornwallis had brought most of his forces with him. That meant there would be far fewer of the enemy in Princeton, and so Washington readied his army for a march that would take them around Cornwallis's troop, troops and toward the college town. He ordered some of his men to stay behind. They were to keep campfires burning and to make noises with their axes and shovels so that the British wouldn't realize that the Amer what the Americans were doing. About one o'clock in the morning on January 3rd, Washington and the main body of his army moved out. Cannon wheels were muffled with rags. Officers whispered orders. The Americans didn't, did everything they could to be quiet, but their, and their plan worked. It was dawn before Cornwallis realized they were gone. Colonel Fitzgerald, horror-struck at the danger of his beloved commander, drew his hat over his face that he might not see him die. The morning was clear and cold, and as Washington and his men neared Princeton, in farmland outside the town, a part of American army encountered the British troops. During that fight that followed, many of the Americans fell. The dazed survivors retreated. Washington rushed to a rally his troops and astride a white horse he led them forward, taking them within 30 yards of the British line. American muskets were pointed at British. British arms were leveled at the Americans. Washington was in between. One of the two sides started firing. It seemed impossible that he would survive. Muskets roared, but when the smoke cleared, General Washington was safe. His troops held steady, but the British line broke and fell back. The Americans advanced. British officers tried to rally the Redcoats, but soon they began to flee. When the American troops ran after them, Washington paused just long enough to give a few orders. Then, spurring his horse, he joined in the pursuit. Within a few hours, the battle was over. George Washington and his men had once again defeated the great military power in the world. Away, my dear colonel, and bring up the troops. The day is our own. General Washington and his men stood with their country in a time of crisis. When they were cold and hungry, they did not quit. When the conflict was hard, they fought on, and when they won, the victory was sweet. News of Trenton and Princeton spread across the land, lifts the spirits of patriots everywhere. May a battle lay ahead, but now Americans could think of winning their war of independence. Now they could imagine that their great struggle would have a glorious end.